The last speaker is David, as known as DHH. He has raised the Ruby on it. Now it is time to get on his agile train. Ladies and gentlemen, all aboard. The title is One Controller Minions Vinyard. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to the team that got me here, Takahashi and the rest of the organizers, and thanks to Seb for um, translating for me. Um, it's a great honor and pleasure to, to be here. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about um, a new direction that I'm trying to take Rails. Um, I'm calling this Discovering a World of Resources on Rails. And I'll explain what that means in just one second, but before I get into the real presentation. I just want to take a few minutes to recount some of the successes we've had over um, the last period. So, <laughs> uh, this is just one example of the kind of media attention that Ruby and Rails has been getting lately. And if not without reason, um, last time I checked, which was fairly recently, we've had over 600,000 downloads of Ruby on Rails. Um, there's been a few books out there. The Agile Web Development with Rails book has sold more than 40,000 copies. Uh, and I think just for the English-speaking market, there's another 12 books coming out on Ruby on Rails this year from various publishers. Um, and that's not even including the bulk of translations and uh, books in other markets. I've Just from the few days I've been here, I've been talking to at least two or three people writing um, Japanese Rails books. So that's very exciting. But despite how far we've come with Ruby on Rails over the last two years, I believe we're still very much in, in the beginning. Um, we're not even in the middle of our growth curve yet. Um, and a friend of 37 Signals who saw this um, cover made a, a funny version of it that I think represents very well where we are in the development of Ruby on Rails. Um, all of you in here has taken the red pill. But the rest of um, the development community has not yet taken the red pill, uh, and they don't know just how deep the rabbit hole goes. But that's not what I want to talk to you about today. Today I want to talk to you about CRUD. Create, read, update, and delete. That's the baseline of instructions that most object-oriented systems operate on. But CROD has a, um, has a bad reputation. There's a lot of people out there building object-oriented systems that don't really like CRUD. They say it's too simplistic. You cannot build real systems just using CRUD. And because it's too simplistic, it's unfulfilling work. It's not fun work for programmers just to build CRUD systems. Um, and thus, since it's too simplistic and it's unfulfilling, it's unworthy of attention for real programmers. And because of all of these things, it's kind of a shameful thing. You don't want to make CRUD systems. It's beneath you and it's not something that highlights your intelligence. Well. I'm here to tell you that they were wrong. Um, and as part of that, I'm going to talk to you about how I learned to stop worrying about these people and what they say, and how I start loving the crud. This, has, this love of crud has been brought on by um, a reinsurgence, a renaissance in web technology. But before we get to that, just a brief overview of what the CRUD is in the systems that we built today. 
You have find, create, update, and destroy. That's how CRUD is presented at an object-oriented layer. Then you have select, insert, update, and delete. That's how CRUD works at the database layer. And these two things map very well together. You call find, and that triggers a select. You call create, it triggers an insert, and so on and so forth. But there's one more layer of CRUD that most people have not been paying enough attention to. That's HTTP. HTTP has another layer of CRUD on top in its four main verbs. Most people have only been using GET and POST. But HTTP is much richer than just GET and POST. HTTP also have methods like PUT and like DELETE. And when you map all of these four methods together, you get to present your entire system uh, from the bottom up as a CRUD system. Now, this has been a recent revelation for me. When I started out working on Rails, I didn't really know too much about HTTP. I thought HTTP was just all about GET and POST. So, I built systems that have URLs like this. You POST to people create, you GET people show one, and you do POST to do updates and you do POST to do destroys. But if you look at these methods, they're not very dry. They're repeating themselves. POST is already built into HTTP, HTTP's way of saying create. So now I'm saying POST, and I'm also saying create in the URL. That's not very dry. It's a repetition. The same goes down through POST, update, um, and destroy. These things are have their own verbs. There's no reason that we need to overload POST for these verbs. Instead, once you start using HTTP to the full extent, you get something like this. This is much prettier, much drier. You use the verbs that HTTP gives us to perform operations on these URLs. And the URLs doesn't contain the behavior. The URL is now only about identity. It's only the ID for what you're finding. And now you're using the verbs instead to signify the actions. And I find, just from an aesthetic perspective, this to be beautiful. Versus this, I now consider it ugly. I don't appreciate how this looks. We're misusing URLs, and I've just come to realize that, that is wrong. So, this is where we want to be. We want to move away from replicating and duplicating the CRUD operations that HTTP already gives us in our URLs. And we've been working on a way to do that. And the way we can do that now is by identifying that the identity in the URLs maps directly to the models. So this exposure we have here is just one model. It's the person model. And if we now say with this new instruction that we are adding to Rails, map resources person, it means that we're now describing that the person uh, object should be available from the web through these methods and through these URLs. Instead of having separate URLs for each of the actions, we now have one URL to signify the collection, one URL to signify one member of that collection, and we use the verbs of HTTP to perform operations on them. The cool thing about resources and verbs is that we already have a set of conventions for how do we figure out which action um, we should invoke when somebody is doing put person one. Which action should we use? Which action should we use when somebody is doing post on slash people? Well, when we came up with scaffolding, we came up with a good set of names actually to describe these things already. So by saying map.resourcesperson, 
you're saying, I want to implement an interface. I want to implement a set of conventions that these HTTP verbs will point to. And when you do that, you get controllers that looks like this. By saying map.resourcesPerson, you're also saying, if somebody makes post people, direct them to the create action. If somebody's saying get person one, they should trigger show. And the same with put and delete. So we map the HTTP verbs to names um, in the controllers according to this simple convention. Which means that you don't have to describe it anywhere. There's no configuration for how should put map into the controller. The, these are the conventions. Now, the problem and one of the reasons we haven't done this before is because HTML only supports get and post. There's no way in HTML of saying put. There's no way in HTML of saying um, delete. But actually, there is. Or we're fooling HTML to believe that there is a way. So how do we map each of these in HTML? The first is easy. The first is the same as we've always done. Form for person, just do what you will always do. By default, forms in Rails are post. So that works just as it always would. The same with show. Show is just the normal link too. When you make an href, that's by default get. So we get what we want. Now, the interesting part comes with update and with destroy. So, whoa. No. So for update, I've now introduced a new way of describing which verb to use. You can now say form for a person, method put. How do I put this method in there? Because there's no way in HTML you can just say method put. We do this by JavaScript, or sorry, by a um, hidden input field. It's called underscore method. So what we're actually doing is using post as a transport layer for put and for delete. So from the HTML layer, we're actually only using get and post, because that's the only thing you can do in HTML. But we're sending along the information about what we really meant. When we did this uh, form for person method put, we really meant it should be a put, even though it's being sent over post. Now, this is significant because since there's no way of doing other verbs than get and post in, in HTML, we needed to fool it somehow. Because the whole reason we're doing all of this is because there are other ways than HTML to interact with a web service with HTTP. And we'll get to that in just one second. But this is just a layer to make such that HTML can access this service in exactly the same way as somebody who does support all of the verbs can do. The same for destroy. Now all of the link to will now have a method um, option where you can specify what kind of method it should be. This is implemented with JavaScript. Just as we had before, we had post equals true if you wanted to make uh, a link that triggered a post action. Now, why do we bother with all of this? Why is it worth inventing this new scheme on top of it just to have some pretty URLs? Well, from the face of it, it can look like a little bit too much work just to get a clean URL. But there's a few more reasons for it. The first of the, them are consistency. If you follow these set of conventions, all your URLs are going to look the same. All your controllers are going to look the same. Now, all of your controllers are just going to implement index, show, destroy, uh, update, edit, and so on and so forth. We are making such that by following these conventions, all controllers should look the same. When they're just doing CRUD operations, they should be very similar. The great thing about consistency is, if all of your controllers look the same, and if everybody's building controllers in the same way, 
you get a lot of simplicity. Your system is easier to understand when everybody is creating systems in the same way. And it's also easier to distribute these URLs. The URLs are always going to look the same. They're going to be short because they don't also include the action. And the great thing about having these simple URLs is that we now also have discoverability. If you have a single URL to a system that's built this way, you know that you can update the model that hides behind this by just doing a put on that URL. You can destroy that model by just doing a delete on that URL. And more so uh, than any of these things in isolation is the notion that Rails is founded on. The notion that constraints are liberating. That constraints are not something that holds you back. Constraints are something that sets you free. Because when you operate under these constraints, when you operate under all of the conventions we have in Rails, you don't need to think about them. You're not wasting brain power on how to come up with a new scheme of exposing your models to the world. You're following a set of conventions that's already been defined, um, and that sets your mind free to think about more important things, like what your application is actually supposed to do. So, I think of this as a straitjacket for my mind to keep me from going insane over the same mundane details over and over again. By following a set of conventions, I've said to myself, let's make this decision once. We'll make the decision one time about how URLs should look, about how we should expose models to the world, and now I never have to worry about that again. So, the full set of how this looks, um, the full mapping, is this. This is our new straitjacket for controllers. Once you choose to adopt these set of conventions, all of your controllers should pretty much look like this. And that's where the real power of this convention comes in. Because once you realize that this new form of controller, that this simplicity is all you should have, you start to think more carefully about overloading controllers. You start thinking more carefully about when to split things up into multiple concerns. Um, when I was not using this approach, when I was building Basecamp, when I was building all of these other applications I was building, I ended up with huge controllers. I ended up with controllers that had 15 methods. A lot of methods that had to do with a lot of different uh, models, not just one thing. And I found that to be uh, a very unsatisfying way of working. I find it to be cluttered, and I find it to be um, not very simple. So, now we come to the part where I'll show a few example of why the, examples of why this really matters. Because these conventions, these constraints, this straitjacket on your mind will force you to be more creative, will force you to come up with a better model will force you to think more object-oriented about your system. Here's an example of how we would normally do a group and users setup. So you have um, a set of groups and users can belong to any number of groups and any group can have any number of users. Very simple. Now, how do you expose a model like that to the world? Well, you would probably do something like the groups controller here. So you would have methods saying add user and remove user. Even though we're in the groups controller, so we're not actually manipulating the group itself, we are manipulating its relationship with users. So by doing so, we get kind of weird URLs. We get URLs saying um, slash group slash one, add user and a user ID. Hmm, there's something wrong here. There's something wrong because you can tell from the methods themselves that we have to namespace them. Instead of just having a method saying add, we have a method saying add user. 
That's a telltale sign that something is not right. That we've not reduced this to the lowest set of um, simplicity that we could. And the other part is we need to make decisions about this. So why is it actually not uh, a uses controller that has join group and leave group? Why is it add user and remove user? Sometimes we would perhaps choose to do this. The next time we would do this. That's brain cycles wasted because we could have made this choice once. So what this new convention is telling us is that any method that looks like join group or leave group are potentially bad or smelly code when you have something that needs to namespace itself, it's a code smell. And you should investigate if there's a cleaner way you can do things. That's what the conventions are forcing you to do. When everything looks the same, actions and methods like these will stand out. Because it's not just call create, it's not just call update, it's not called the same things and all, as all the rest of the system is. So, this, is a, this case is more or less what forced me to start thinking about this. Because I said to myself, I want a clean controller. I want the controller we were looking at before that just had the index, the create, the show, and so on. When I thought about it like that, I realized that I was missing something in my model. I was not only having groups and uses. Just as the slide you saw from Marek earlier, I was missing a join. I was missing the notion of memberships. So. You, Uses don't just belong to groups. Uses have memberships, and through that membership, they belong to a group. Now, I've enriched my model. My understanding of the problem is deeper now, because I've exposed an implicit notion before. Before, we just had a many-to-many -many relationship, but it was kind of vague what that many-to-many -many relationship really was. When we expose it as a membership, it suddenly becomes clear. And now that it's clear that the relationship between groups and users is actually memberships, we can also get the clean controller. Because instead of trying to manipulate users on the group's controller, we, it's now obvious which kind of controller we should have. We should have a membership controller. When we have a membership controller, we can do things like create and destroy. We no longer need to namespace everything. And we get prettier URLs. We get a single URL that describes that relationship. Before, we had no single URL to say, that user belongs to that group. We would always have to interact with it through other means. So I think that this model and this implementation is much prettier and it's much more um, simple actually to deal with than, than this implementation. This implementation is messy because we miss something, we miss the membership. And by having this notion of CRUD, that CRUD is good and we should strive for CRUD always, we're driven to this implementation. Another example. So assume you have a system where you have accounts and these accounts have plans. They're on some uh, plan on your system where they're paying a monthly fee for your service. Now, the relationship between account and plan is a little bit of a weird one. Plans are abstract things. Plans are stuff like you get 100 megabytes a month for $5. It's not really your plan, it's the plan in general. Ver versus the account, it's your account. Each person has his own account. Each person doesn't really have its own plan. And that's where the trouble comes in. You can see the account model has a notion of figuring out whether this account could be upgraded to a new plan. You can have the premium plan, the gold plan, and so on and so forth. And we need the logic currently in the account model. So the account model itself needs to figure out whether it's eligible for the upgrade, whether it's possible for it to do the upgrade, um, and we need to somehow interact with that method in the account controller. So again, now we have something called upgrade plan. 
That's bad. It's not called create. It's not called update. It's not called any of these things we are supposed to be calling things if we only really want to do crud. So this is again alerting us. It's a code smell. We can sniff out that this is probably a bad design. And because we're doing that, we start to think more about the relationship between accounts and plans. And what we realize is that that relationship has a name. The name is subscription. An account doesn't just have a plan. An account has a subscription to a plan. Again, just like the other example, we've made our domain richer. We've made our understanding of the problem domain richer. And the wonderful thing about now having this subscription model is that we have a perfect place to describe um, the validation rules. Before, we had validation rules about whether an account could upgrade to a new plan on the account itself. That's not a good place to put it. An account should be about the things that identifies an account, not about plans, not about subscriptions. So if we pull logic out and put it into a better place, we've put it into the relationship between account and plan instead of having it on um, the account itself. And again, now we've done this, we have create. We now no longer have this upgrade plan method. We can now just have a create method onto subscription controller, which again means we can have simple URLs, we can have a discoverable interface. So, what all of this is, in some sense, is that we're using CRUD to teach us something about our domain, to teach us something about our models. And the prime thing it's teaching us is that models are more than just things. Models are not just uh, an account, or a project, or something like that. Models can be relationships. Models can be memberships and subscriptions, as we've seen, not just things. And even more than two examples, models can be events. You can model something that happened in time, not just the thing it happened to. Models can be states. Models can be um, describing what some other model is, where it is in time, and the, the logic that goes behind that. So this whole set of, or this whole approach, where we're using CRUD to teach us something more about our uh, model, is something um, I like to call the angel tactic. So all developers always have an angel on the one shoulder and a devil on the other shoulder. When you don't have good conventions to guide you to the right solution, you have a very strong devil. You have a strong devil that just says, put another method on this controller. It doesn't matter if it already has 15 methods. What does one method more or less matter? And that's the way you get a spaghetti system. That's the way you get just one big pile of mud that you can't maintain um, shortly thereafter. CRUD is an angel tactic. CRUD is an invitation all along to say, you could think harder about your problem. There's something you have not yet discovered about your problem, and if you just thought a little harder about it, you would see what that is. Okay, so this is kind of a song for CRUD and why CRUD is a good idea. But, you can't always do CRUD. CRUD is not a goal in itself. It's an aspiration. We're trying to get to CRUD and we're using that um, journey as a design technique. We're using as a design technique that allows us to look at a piece of code and say, this doesn't look right. There's namespaces in the method names. Um, we can't just call things create or update. There's something not quite right about it. But sometimes that will mean that we can think harder about our problem domain and we can come up with new models such as subscription and such as membership. That's not always the case. And I'll show you one example of when it's not the case, when I found it not to be the case. So, I'm calling this case with a K, but it's actually supposed to be with a C. You just can't call something case 
in Ruby if it's underscore because it's reserved name. So this is why it's called case. <laughs> anyway, um, case is a model that has a, a method here called close. So you can close a case and say we don't, this case is no longer active. The problem with that is that closing a case is not just simply updating one attribute. And when it's not just updating one attribute, it's hard to use something like just an update method on the case controller to do it. Because to close a case, you now have to make sure you both update the closed app at what time it was closed, and the boolean closed. That's bad design too. It's bad design to have this single notion of case closure split out over two attributes you manually have to update. That's not a very, that's not good encapsulation. So, in this case, I'm choosing to say, okay, we will actually have a method that's not called create, create or update, we will have something called close. And it will have kind of an ugly URL, because ugly according to our new standards of what a pretty URL is. So it'll be first the identity part, slash cases, slash one, that's identifying what case are we talking about, then, to separate what is identity and what is action in the URL, we've started to use the semicolon. Because the semicolon can now separate um, what the action and what the identity of the uh, model we're operating on is. Versus the old way. The old way was slash cases, slash show, slash one it was not clear what part of that URL was the identity of the object we were talking about and the action we were performing on it. So, this is basically saying we can, if we must, expose something that's not CRUD and when we do, we will use POST. Because when we're changing things according to good HTTP practice, we should use POST, not GET. And it's then identity, <coughs> semicolon, the aspect of what we are updating. We are not just updating the thing itself, we are updating one aspect of it. Um, and we can do the same thing with get. Sometimes you have more than one way of showing the same object. So, for example, you'll have cases one will represent the normal view of a case. But what if you need to edit that case? You need a URL for that too. In that example, we'll use the same technique, the semicolon edit, and then it'll be slash identity slash view. It'll describe kind of like this it describes an aspect of what we want to update. This describes kind of a view of what, how we want to see that um, model. But even though this is a case where I'm saying this might be something where you should not use CRUD, we should certainly realize that you can always use CRUD. It's just a way of what's least painful. So here are a few examples of how you could actually have used a CRUD um, way of describing this domain. Closure. Instead of just having a close action, you could have a model that represented closure. That would be the event. We would now be modeling an event that a case is closed, and actually, if you have, if you need to record more data about the closure, like who closed it, who closed the case, this might be a good thing to do. Because you can very quickly overload the case with all the information you need to capture about the closure event. And if you model it like this, you're back to the, the pretty way of just using CRUD. And this is an event approach to it. You could also have a state approach to it. So, Cases has one progress. It has a way of describing what is its current progress. Its initial progress might be that it's open, and you can now say, uh, what's the progress of this case? And it'll return an open object. You can have multiple states, such as this case has been reviewed, and when it's been reviewed, we also want an association to a verifier, some person who's verified that this case has been reviewed, and finally we can have a closed state. So these are just two examples of how you can always use CRUD, but in this particular example, when I only wanted to record the fact that the case was closed and when it was closed, I found it easier just to say, okay, 
I will go outside of CRUD for this one case. But the important part was that I was making that a conscious decision. I was trading off, do I want consistency or do I just want uh, ease of use in this example? Okay, I think actually just using CRUD as a design technique to make you think harder about your problem um, is reason enough to do all of this. The current project I'm working on, which is something called Sunrise, I've used this technique and I currently only have um, CRUD operations. And the design of my application is so much simpler um, than it would otherwise have been. And I have a much richer understanding of my, my problem domain. So I'm really happy about using CRUD, about using HTTP and the verbs just as a way of forcing me to be a better programmer, to be a better designer. But there is more. There's more reason that you just want to follow these set of conventions and how to do this. One of the reasons is um, MIME types. This is actually the original title of this presentation that we just want to use one controller and we have many clients. We want to have one action that can return many different types of results and we want a flexible input model. We want a flexible way of accepting parameters. So together with this notion of CRUD, we can use MIME types to distinguish between clients but not build separate controllers and not build separate actions. Here's an example. A people controller has an index method. In this new respond to block, I've described five different formats. So this single controller and this single method can return five different types of um, responses, depending on the mind type. So the first format is HTML. This can return an HTML which will just come from index RHTML. We can return JavaScript to use it with RJS. We can just return XML using the new to XML method on, on people. ICL, the calendar format ICAL, if we want to present these people in a calendar, perhaps showing their birthday. And finally an Atom, just like RSS, feed. The important part about this block is that we just have one action. And the shared data that all of these responses need, we only do one time. We just have one saying, find all the people. All of these formats will use the same people data. So this is much more dry than having separate methods for all of these different formats. Now, how do we get this out to the client? Um, here I have some examples of HTTP requests. If you just do a get on slash people, you will get HTML back because that's the for first format. So if you have no clues um, from the client of what he wants, what type of mind type he wants, it'll take the first one. Second, we use the accept header of HTTP to describe um, what you want back. If you want something different back than the, um, than the standard, you can say so in the accept header. So if we pass the accept header and say get people, um, we can get our JS back. That's what the prototype JavaScript library does. So when you make a request from Ajax, from JavaScript, you will get JavaScript back because prototype put in the accept header that it wants and it prefers text slash JavaScript. The problem with the accept header is that oftentimes you don't have access to it. Your clients can't specify the accept header. It's a newsreader or it's a mobile phone or something. So we've just come up with a name of using the extension that you can override whatever's in the accept header by just using an extension. Again, we have the same controller. This URL is mapped to the same controller, the same action. It's just using the extension to say which format do we want back. So we can just say .xml and now we'll get XML back. And this just shows that the extension wins. So if there is an accept header and we still say .xml, we'll get XML back. 
this is great because this also means that when you're testing your service, the thing you're doing, you can just put .xml back to see an XML representation of what you're working on. You can say .rss and you'll get the RSS feed of the same thing. So we're using the same principle of having the same URL, so we're going to have discoverability. Any URL we have, we can just say .xml. If we have defined a way of formatting this as XML, we'll get XML back. Pretty cool. Now, this is the output. We can do the same thing on um, the input. So sometimes this is creating a new person, and we can create a new person and expect three different things back. So, a new HTTP request, we post to people, and we just do it with the normal URL parameters. Person, name, David, it'll trigger format HTML, which will do a redirect and show our browser somewhere else. But, here comes the interesting part. You can also pass in XML. If you want to expose a web service, you can use exactly the same code um, and just pass in your parameters as XML. It'll use exactly the same structure. What we're doing here is basically saying XML is just a hash. So we're marking up, just as we had with person David name, this is exactly the same. The controller doesn't know the difference between person name David uh, and in XML and, and as in um, normal parameters. So. If we pass that in, we'll trigger format XML, which will give us a header back that shows the location of the new uh, person, and renders nothing. Because that's a good way in general of how to do web services. When you post something, you should just get the new location to the thing back. Now, the interesting part is we can mix and match. So we can post to people.xml, but use normal parameters. By using normal parameters and XML, we'll still trigger format XML, so we can actually test out our entire web services just from a browser, because the browser doesn't know how to format its properties as XML, but we can mix and match these two. Um, and this is again an example where we're posting something and we're using the accept header to describe what we want back, and we're just using normal um, URL parameters. So, this is great for all the standard MIME types. All the standard MIME types out there, XML, JavaScript, HTML, and so on and so forth. What if you want to invent your own formats? This is an example of coming up your, with your own MIME type for a mobile format. Just as you have a way of outputting XML and JavaScript, you want a way of outputting something special for the mobile platform. That might be a reduced set of HTML or something else. So you first, you register your new MIME type, you can just come up with a new MIME type. MIME types are, um, you're free to come up with your own if you just use that X dash syntax. Now that we have our own MIME type, we can say, if people access the URL in a special way, say mobile slash people, it'll use the format of mobile. And in our controller, we can then use exactly the same format format.mobile if the request is coming from the mobile URL. So we're using multiple URLs to point to the same controller. And all of this gives us is a way to have many ways of accessing the same controller depending on what we want back, what kind of format we want back, and what kind of way we want to mark up our parameters. Which means that one URL or one controller can serve both RSS feeds, it could be a web services interface, it could be an HTML, uh, normal HTML web application, it can have a different mobile interface. All of these things from just one controller. I think that's pretty cool, but all of that um, leads us to something almost as important. When we're following all of these conventions, where all of our URLs look the same, when we have all of these verbs, we have a convention and a consistency. And as soon as you have convention and consistency, you have an opportunity to automate things. So that's the one more thing. The one more thing is that we're announcing um, that just yesterday I actually came up with the idea of 
active resource. Active resource is going to be a new framework for Rails that allows you to build on top of web services that uses these techniques I've described in this presentation and you can get these back as active records. So basically you can get models that builds on top of web services and behave just like active records, almost, but they're calling web services instead. Here's an example of how the code probably is going to look. I've not written it all yet, so this is just the design. First, we start out declaring a new person uh, model. We're declaring this new person model and saying it's an active resource. It lives at this URL. It lives at this URI. We can also define credentials. Credential would make it such that if our web service is password protected, it'll use password protection with HTTP authentication. And we can now declare that this resource uses something like that. Now, when we've declared that, we have an object that works a lot like active records work. You can be able to say person.find1, and because we're following these conventions, it knows that it needs to do a get, because that's what you should do when you do a find. Um, it'll get from the same URL that we declared of them, the person, slash one, because that's the ID we're searching for. When it gets that, it'll see XML coming back. When it gets XML coming back, it'll take that XML, just as it would do if it got a record back from the database, and turn it into a real live object. So now you found that, you can say maps.name, and you'll get maps. Um, that's just a quick example if you just want to mark something quick up. But you can also, well, actually, here's the rest of that example. So you can find something, but you can also save something. We can create a new person, when we try to save that person, it'll do a post to that URL again we declare it because we can guess the URLs. Because we've said we want consistencies in these URLs and when we have consistencies, there's no need to configure what's the create method URL. It's just going to be the same thing and we're just going to be post against it. When we post against it, we send our parameters as XML. So we've marked up that name equals David. Uh, turns it to this piece of XML, and then when we save it, we get the location back. As you guys remember from before, when we had format.xml, the convention is that you should return the URL of the new object you just created. When we get that back, we get the new ID. So, slash people slash two means that we now know that the David resource lives at slash two, which means that his ID is two. We can change the name to my full name. And when we save again, just as with a database, the first time you save something, you do a break. The second time you save something, you do an update. The HTTP way of doing an update is called put. And we just put the same thing, um, whoa, that's actually the wrong URL. It should have been slash people slash two. You're not putting to the collection, you're putting to that resource in particular. But now when we've saved that, we've updated the resource. So we've basically exposed our whole web service API as just almost active records. So we're making it just as easy to interact with web services as it is to interact with a database. Here's a slightly more advanced example where we don't just want to use a struct. We want to have a real model. So first we have this Sunrise resource. That's just a way of having a base class for all the resources that lives on this application. We down or we uh, subclass from the Sunrise resource and declare a new person. These objects can have their own methods. So we can make the resources richer by creating full methods around them that can actually do things. Just like with Active Record, the whole reason for doing Active Record is that you want something more than just the database rollback you want to be able to manipulate it as a real uh, object. So you can find the person, just as we did before, and I'll call dot first name, and it'll take one of that back to the web service, and just split it into two to give me the first name, even though the web service itself did not have a first name method. So this is just a simple way of um, showing that. More complex and more interesting is 
as that case example we had before, we can implement something like close. We can implement the fact that we want to call a custom method on the remote resource. Imagine that we had that resource we were looking at before, where we had the code, the close, or the case, and it had a close method. We now want to call that remotely um, on our resource here, and we can do that in the same way. So we call the remote close, then we update the local object, and what we basically get is an implementation, a remote implementation to, to the same object. So first it'll do a post when we try to close it, it'll call this semicolon close thing. Um, what we get back is how the case now looks, the attributes that were new, newly generated. Now that it has the boolean that it is closed, it'll also get when we actually closed it. And we can now correlate these two things. So, this is a simple way of exposing and interacting with web services that are built according to the new conventions that we're imposing on Rails. So, this mostly only works when you're following those conventions. But just like Active Record, I'm sure we'll find some way of wrapping this around web services that were not built according to, just like we have set table name if your um, database models doesn't follow that the class is single or the table is plural. We can have the same kind of things. And just as interesting, we can have um, different kinds of requesters. So one problem when you're doing simple REST web services is that if the request fails, it's lost. So if you're trying to do an update and the web service in the other end is down, what do you do with that request? So the idea is that we'll build in separate uh, kinds of requesters. You can have an asynchronous request that they'll record that you wanted to update the case, but the web service was down right now, so we'll try to update it again every five seconds or every three minutes. Um, and that's basically it. That is um, where we're taking Rails with version 1.2. It's big focus on making it super easy to create web services, such that all new web applications that come out have no excuse for not having a web services API, and to make it really easy to handle multiple forms of output. Whether you want your controllers to output PDF, or Excel, or serve mobile clients, or XML, or HTML, you should not have to build multiple controllers, and you should not have to duplicate your logic. Thank you. You told us uh, we start already using put and delete. We would be easier or possible with the new framework to have uh, access to my application via web dev. Like, can I mount my uh, rail site from my Go Connect Mac and drag and drop images to it? That would be pretty cool. Um, I think that this new approach we're trying to do when we're using a richer HTTP using more of the verbs will also work if somebody wants to extend that to web dev. We've already now made it um, just easier to fake that you're doing a put and delete. We could make it just as easy for your web service to, to do what the verbs are called in, in web dev. I, I don't need web dev myself, so hopefully somebody who do need web dev will take this new stuff and make it work with that. Thank you. えっと、質疑応答とかって翻訳あった方がいいですか。あ、じゃあ、今ですね、説明しますと、お願いします。はい、じゃあ、じゃあ、また。あ、ごめんなさい、説明お願いします。日本語でちょっとお願いしたいん
、えー、と拡張子だけじゃなくてあの、えー、とユーザーエンジェルとのエッダーとかを見てあの需要を切り替えたりとかっていうのは対応できないんでしょうか Um, yes, so you can either just rely on that new MIME type registration or you can also manipulate the accept header yourself. So, what you can do is make a before filter that looks at the user agent and says if this is a Docomo phone, push a new MIME type for Docomo phones on the accept header, then you can say format.docomo. And then you'll be able to give a view just for the Dogomo phones or just for Nokia phones or just for some other kind of phone by looking at the, at the user agent. And you'll just do this in a before filter. So the great thing about this is that we'll expose that except. Except header is basically a list of priorities saying what would the browser prefer or what would the client prefer to get back. And you can manipulate that from any kinds of variables. It could be if they access your site from a different host. So, for example, you could have docomo.myapplication.com, and that will say everybody who's accessing the application through that URL will get the docomo、um, interface, and somebody who's accessing nokia.myapplication.com will get the Nokia interface. Thank you. じゃあ、<笑><笑><笑> Thank you for your very good, impressive presentation.、Uh, I was very surprised because、uh, <coughs> my last question to answer、uh, was just in your presentation. And <coughs> I want to use、uh, the feature of respond to, respond to feature, but I couldn't find it.、Uh, oh, oh, I, I bought last summer.、Uh, Last time I bought your book and read it twice. <laughs> But I'm afraid I,、uh, couldn't, I missed、uh, the feature of Respond to.、Uh, is it available in the current version of Rails? But if not,、uh, how soon could I?、Uh, is it available? Yeah, a lot of these new features and all of, some of the features I just showed are not in the released version yet. They're going to come in 1.2. And even the Respond2 that's in 1.1、um, is too new to be in most of the book. The second edition of Agile Web Development with Rails will most likely include a discussion of the Respond2 stuff as well.、Um, but yeah, one thing we do miss is more documentation on, on how to do things like this. So once we finish with Rails 1.2, We'll put out some documentation, at least in English, and we can hopefully get that translated、uh, on how to use this. And especially, I know that、um, especially all this new format stuff is great for if you work with mobile phones. So I'm sure there's a lot of people here in Japan、um, who can take that stuff and, and make it even better. Thank you very much. レコード大変面白いと思ったんですけども、えっと、今のお話だと次のバージョンで入る予定のアクティブレコードは、えっと、サービス側もレールで作ってないとうまくつながらないような気がしたんですけどもそういうわけではないんですかアクティブリソースあっすみませんアクティブリソースの話ですあっもう一回すみませんすみません今の話だとアクティブリソースが使いたいサービス側もレールズで作ってないとうまくつながらないような気がしたんですよ。Yes, so the first version of Active Resource 
will probably only work with web services that are built like this, with Rails. Later versions of Active Resource could definitely also work with systems who are built in slightly different ways. Just like Active Record can work with databases that are not designed for Active Record, we'll make ways of uh, putting in options such that your Active Resources can work with other services. But Active Resource will only be for REST services, for HTTP and XML. Not so, not XML RPC. Those things you can use Action Web Service or some other things with. Active Resource will only be for REST web services. Thank you. Thank you very much. あ、はい、ありがとうございます。えっと、フレームワークの中でその認証とかの仕組みをリストしようっていう話とか進んでるんでしょうか。いや。オッケー。うん、いやいや。オッケー。ちょっと私が先に今回質問だけど。The first version of active um resource will probably only support HTTP authentication. Or, and hopefully somebody will do an HTTP digest authentication implementation too. But if you want to use something like Cerberus or something else, um, it probably has to be a plugin. Um, the default approach will be HTTP authentication and we'll encourage people to use that over SSL, just that it's secure and encrypted. Does that answer your question? Or <笑>ちょっと、ちょっと、もう一度。あ、じゃ。とりあえず今の、今のを返してください。ああ、今の答えは大体は最初のバージョンが HTTP authentication to SSL がつながれれば大丈夫です。でも多分それが正しいの質問ですか答える。すいません。あ、では、えっと、最後に一つだけ、あと一つだけ質問を受けたいと思います。どなたかいらっしゃいますか<笑><笑><笑> <笑>え、日本語です。ください。えっと、アクティブリソース大変面白かった、面白いものだと思います。で、え、ちょっと思ったんですけれど、えっと、アクティブリソースのXMLRPC版ですとか、え、ソープ版ですとかで、あの、単